My name's Gavin Dekawaiya. I'm a research fellow in the Centre for Primary Care, uh, which is part of the Institute of Population Health. Uh, my background is broadly in health services research, but I've tended to specialise more in uh, qualitative research, uh, and of late also in the, the synthesis of qualitative research. So in this brief session today, uh, I just want to give an overview of what's meant by meta-ethnography. Uh, historically, um, ethnography was the field method used by um, anthropologists and social anthropologists, and they generally live amongst a group, a culture, or a community, and they collect data using a range of techniques, but most frequently probably observations and interviews, they might keep a journal or a diary of their own. So the meta narrative is a, is a word that we hear quite a lot, especially in kind of media context. So people might be having a conversation which on the surface of it seems to be about one thing, but if you actually look a bit kind of deeper or conceptually, you might find that the, the conversation's about um, something else that might have a um, hidden meanings. But metroethnography um, is essentially a way of synthesizing the results of research um, Studies which involve um, qualitative methods of data uh, collection and analysis. So it's, it's kind of a qualitative equivalent of meta analysis, um, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Um, in this brief uh, presentation this afternoon, I just want to talk you through the background origins of meta ethnography, which was in education research. Meta ethnography can be used in in a variety of disciplines, but um, I'm going to be focusing on health services research because that's where I work and that's my background, but there might be others of you who are coming from sociology, law, or wherever, you know, this, this method can be used in a variety of contexts. I'm going to point you to some of the key texts, some um, classic examples of what are considered to be good, metrosnographies. Um, I'm going to uh, allude to the kind of distinction between metaethnography or metasynthesis of qualitative research more generally and meta-analysis when you're kind of analyzing um, statistics. I want to introduce you to the seven steps of metaethnography. Um, if you only take away one message from this uh, presentation this afternoon, I suppose I want to kind of draw a distinction between the subjective parts of metrosnography and the more kind of systematized or mechanistic approaches. So there are some things which would be reproducible from researcher to researcher, like the researcher strategy that you use, the quality appraisal tool. But when you get to the kind of um, conceptual and analytical aspects, like in a primary qualitative research itself, they do tend to be more subjective enterprises. So if you had a, a researcher A doing it from a, from a particular background and education, they might not necessarily come to the same conclusions as a researcher B, who might come from a different background. So that's just something um, I'd like you to bear in mind. The other thing that I would say is that um, Metroethnography is, is methodologically challenging work. You, you have to be able to read texts at kind of a high level of, of abstraction and conceptualization that moves beyond uh, the words uh, itself. It isn't always easy. A bit like in a primary qualitative work itself, often the best way to do that is to kind of immerse yourself in the text, read them, reread them, and then uh, Hopefully, some meaningful analysis will uh, emerge from that. And I'm going to point you to some ongoing methodological concerns. So, in a nutshell, metroethnography is a way of synthesizing the results of a qualitative studies of something that's akin to a kind of systematic review. Um, metroethnography, however, tends to be put to service to research that's been conducted from a social science background. So rather than looking for kind of an effectiveness in terms of a number, it's more used to develop theories or models from a body of 
literature. It shares some aspects with, with a primary or qualitative research. So in, in a primary or qualitative research, researchers will normally be analysing texts of interviews or field notes. Um, they might be looking at various media, multimedia videos, photographs. And this is a similar um, technique, but it's applied to, to published uh, qualitative research. So the published report is kind of um, treated in the same way that um, an interview transcript might be in, in a qualitative research. So this was the first text that um, described the method of metroethnography. That's a picture of George Novelet there, um, who, who I had the good fortune to meet when he visited the uh, University of Bristol for, for a research project I was working on uh, then. Uh, in the year 2000. I think this text was written in 1988 or, or, or thereabouts. It's a slim uh, volume. I think it's just 100 pages or something like that. Uh, for anyone who's thinking about uh, undertaking metroethnography, I definitely recommend you to read it. So the background from this um, text was um, Noblet and his colleagues have done some research about the desegregation of schools in the southern United States. So these were sub schools that used to be segregated between black students and white students and then at some stage the, the, the schools were desegregated so that they then had a mixed ethnic population. So there were findings from, it was either three or four ethnographers, I can't remember which, and on the face of it, the findings of each of these ethnographers appeared to be contradictory. So this was an attempt to kind of work out why the findings were different in each of these different ethnographers. However, Noblet and Hare found that when they went through a systematic route to kind of analyse the findings in a conceptual sense, they in fact found that the ethnographies were talking about the same things. Uh, so even though the findings appeared different, they were just different aspects of the same uh, thing. So that's the background of metrethnography. Um, as, I've, as I've said, it's very distinct from uh, a metreth, um analysis for an effectiveness review. So this is um, a box and forest plot that I've picked from uh, Wikipedia. So if you were doing um, a meta-analysis of trials, these would be individual trials that each have a particular outcome of interest. Uh, and these are the results for each trial in terms of an odds ratio. I'm guessing this is kind of a confidence interval um, either side of that. And then you end up with some kind of mean is maybe too uh, simplistic a word, but you end up with a summary measure that it captures all the results of these trials in one measure, and that can be expressed in a in a statistical form. When it comes to analysing the reports of um, qualitative research, we're dealing with rather with pages of text. Um, this is um, a page of text from a qualitative uh, research project that I was involved in, which was about patients' experiences of ataxia. So. When you get to the findings of the qualitative report, you'll typically have some kind of narrative, and then that will be backed up by example quotes taken from interviews. So hopefully you can see on the face of it that the challenges of trying to um, synthesize information like that are maybe a bit more complex than if we've got a series of numbers that we can feed into the um, Redman software to give us uh, a box and forest plot. Now, in Noblet and Hare's um, original text, they suggested that there are three ways that the findings of, of um, qualitative studies might speak um, to each other in a synthesis. So the first of these was uh, they might speak to each other in a reciprocal way, which essentially says that the, the, the findings from the different studies are kind of saying the same things. You, can't, you might have um, a reputational synthesis where one group of findings seems to contradict um, another uh, group of findings and I suppose the, the trick for the synthesizer then is trying to tease out the kind of demographic or other 
characteristics which might explain why the findings were different in one study than in another. It might have been that the studies were based in different co countries, so all the results from the United States might say one thing and all the results from the UK might say another. So that might tell you something about the, the context of the health system or something like that. Uh, and the other um, way that they find that, that, that um, studies might fit is they might speak to different aspects um, of a line of argument or another way to conceive of this is kind of pieces of a jigsaw or a, or a mosaic so until you put all the, the pieces of the jigsaw together and you see everything as a whole you're not really uh, sure what the story is and then you can use that in order to develop a line of argument which, which could lead to a, a new interpretation um, and I suppose the, 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 the strength or the particular feature of metroethnography um, as compared with other forms of uh, qualitative synthesis is that if it's done well it's supposed to lead to new interpretations that go above and beyond what was contained in the original reports uh, in the first place. So, um, Noblet and Hare kind of described the, the, the method of metroethnography as, as, as uh, breaking down into seven simple steps. So, first of all, you have to get started. What do you want to do uh, a metasynthesis about? Why do you want to do it? What's the research uh, question? Then you need the next thing you need to do is kind of select the, the studies, find which ones are, are relevant to the research question that you're asking. Then you've got actually got to read the uh, reports uh, and extract information uh, from them. Then you want to try and get some initial assessment of how the studies seem to be related. So do they appear to be mainly reputational? Are they arguing with each other? Are they all saying the same things? Do they kind of speak to different pieces of a jigsaw? Once you've gone through that kind of process of comparing the findings in different ways, you then synthesize all the different attempts you've made to uh, translate the findings into each other and then finally the synthesis is uh, presented in some way or, or, a, or another from an academic um, standpoint. <coughs> synthesis will normally be uh, presented as either uh, an, an article for a journal or perhaps a thesis for a PhD or something like that, but it will be immediately obvious that if you've got 80,000 words of a PhD thesis in order to explain what you've done and what you've found, then the, the end result is going to be fun different from if you've only got uh, 5,000 words to uh, present it in a journal article. Of course it would be possible to present the results in more kind of artistic way, so you could have a film or a play, um, you know, it, I suppose it all depends on the primary material that you're working with in the first place. So following the the publication of Noblet and Hare's text, there was a, a group of health services researchers in the UK who became interested in metroethnography uh, and if it, it, it might be used to synthesize uh, qualitative research in more of a, a health services research uh, type of a context. Um, so I suppose inevitably this um, became more informed by the science of systematic review and effectiveness reviews within the kind of Cochrane idea about uh, synthesizing evidence in order to, to generate um, research ideas as is uh, argued here in this seminal paper that uh, the main thing that metroethnography can do is produce middle range theories which can then be expressed as a hypothesis hypothesis which you'd be able to test in some, some other research endeavour, be it uh, qualitative and uh, quantitative. Um, as I go uh, through uh, this afternoon, I'm going to point you to a, a few um, key texts. Um, so these are examples of metrosynographies which are considered to be uh, classics in the field or give a particularly good um, account uh, of what they've done in the findings of the country. So an early example was uh, Pandora Pound's paper uh, from 2005 where they looked at 
uh, qualitative research which was about lay experiences of taking prescription drugs. Mm. In case anyone thinks that I'm just trying to present my own work here, I should state that even though I'm, I'm, I'm named as an author here, my role in this project was quite small. I was just a second, second screening abstract. So for anyone who's interested in abstract screening and if you should have single or double workers, uh, as a result of me doing the, the second screening, I think we found one extra paper that could be included in, in the report. Mm -hmm. So um, another kind of classic in the field, um, which was completed a few years later, was Alice Malpass's work. This again was focused on medicine to taking, but this was a specifically about patients' experiences of taking antidepressant uh, drugs. And this work is often cited as a key methodological text. So the work that, that uh, Pandora Pound did uh, on her medications uh, synthesis was part of a program of work uh, at the University of Bristol where they did a kind of methodological um, evaluation. So Pandora did uh, attempted a synthesis about lay experiences of medication use and I um, undertook one which was about lay experiences of rheumatoid arthritis. The medications taking one worked in the sense that it led to, to more conceptual development. The arthritis one that I worked on didn't seem to work in that there was no kind of further conceptual uh, development that went beyond the studies themselves. And the reasons for that um, is something I'm going to allude to um, towards the end. But this is uh, freely available um, online. I think the report runs to two or three hundred pages, but it's well worth a look um, if you're considering doing um, a metro ethnography because there's various chapters in there about um, critical appraisal, um, extraction of data, um, etc. Just while I'm on the subject of um, resources, um, for those of you who are thinking about undertaking any type of uh, qualitative uh, synthesis in the health field, it's well worth checking out the uh, resources available at the Cochrane uh, Qualitative and Implementation Methods Group. And one thing that they have on there is they have their core library of qualitative synthesis methodology. So the, the Campbell report I've already pointed you to, Pandora Pounds um, Synthesis and those of Alice Malpass are all mentioned as core texts um, in the field. Um, finally, uh, well, I think I've got two more resources actually to point you to. If you're considering um, writing a metrosnography for publication in a journal or for a thesis, so there are these NTREC standards um, which are reporting standards for reporting syntheses of uh, qualitative research. I should stress that these don't apply only to metrosnography, they apply to other kinds of uh, qualitative synthesis if you were doing a metasynthesis or a best fit uh, framework uh, synthesis uh, for example. These are the kind of standards that apply at the moment. Just last year, uh, Emma France, who I think is based at the University of Stirling and colleagues, did a systematic review of kind of the quality of reports of metroethnography. It's very self-referential, isn't it? A systematic review of reviews. Um, but where they're heading with this is her team are going on to develop specific reporting standards for metroethnography and that's work in uh, progress at the moment. Um, so that's well worth um, checking out. So having pointed you to, to some of the key um, resources in the field and kind of laid out the, the history and the background um, and the development of the method and specifically uh, in health services research. I now just want to introduce you um, to a kind of broad overview of Noblet and Hare's uh, seven um, steps. Um, and as I do this, I'll try to give you a breakdown of what's meant in each uh, step. And I'll also sometimes draw on some of the example metrosnographies that I've already referred you to and others so you can see how these are actually used in, in kind of um, practice. 
So the first thing in terms of getting started, I suppose, is you know why do you want to do a metasynthesis of uh, qualitative research? What's what's your research uh, question? If you're just interested in trying to summarise or aggregate findings across a body of literature, which is a reasonable thing to do, it might be that a, th um, a thematic synthesis would, would, would work would be better for that, or some kind of narrative review. If you're not working with a theory, or a theory, or you're not looking to build some some kind of theory, that might be an easier way forward. The general advice is that um, a metrosnography is easier with a, a, a smaller number of studies, probably 12 to 20 is probably a reasonable number to work with. Once you get over 40, it, it starts becoming a bit of a nightmare. In practice, if you've got a large number of studies, you have to break them down into smaller groups, and you might have a look at each of those groups as one of your uh, translations, I suppose, and then the synthesis would involve uh, bringing all those together. You might ha have an existing theory that you want to test in, in some way, um, kind of validate it through uh, results of the literature. There are other ways that you can do that using best fit uh, framework synthesis, which was um, has been used by Simon Carroll and colleagues at Shah at the University of um, Sheffield. But essentially, if you're doing a metro ethnography, you want some kind of conceptual research question that requires an interpretive, uh, qualitative approach similar to the approach that might be used in, in, in a qualitative research. So when Pandora Pound uh, and her team did their synthesis of late experience medicine takings, the aim here was to try and progress the field. Um, I suppose they saw that there was quite um, a saturated field of, of, of uh, qualitative research that wasn't um, saying anything new, and I suppose they wanted to do a formal kind of evaluation of what was out there at the moment and try and take things forward. Uh, now the systematic review I referred you to by Emma Franson, colleague, has done kind of an equality appraisal of recently published metrosnographies and the reason I've picked out this one by Bridgie uh, Franson and colleagues is it was one that scored um, amongst the highest in the uh, equality uh, appraisal review that they did. The reason that I'm, I'm introducing it here is that you'll see that the, the topic that we're interested in here relates to a specific theory around personalised or individualised medicine. So they're actually going, they, they plan to interrogate a body of literature using this, this uh, specific theory. Um, so in this um, the Franzel um, synthesis. The goal of the project here was to describe the concepts, expectations, and perceptions of individualized medicine and inherently patients' reasons for using complementary and alternative medicine as documented in qualitative studies. So once you've decided what you're going to do, uh, you've then got to decide how you're going to find papers, what you're going to include, uh, what you're going to exclude. So for, for Pandora Pound, they were interested in papers, obviously, that were about lay views of medicine taking. But they made an early decision that they weren't interested in medicines that were being taken for preventative purposes. So I suppose if you're on a um, statin or a blood pressure medication or something like that, you're not actually taking a drug for, for symptoms that you have there. So they already knew from a conceptual sense early on that the stories around uh, preventative medicine will probably be different uh, from those from others. And I think the other point that's worth making is that Nikki Britton and others who were in that group were kind of international experts in that field of uh, qualitative experience in medicine taking and had already undertaken some of the primary research themselves. So after you've made your mind up about what you're going to do, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the um, selection and searching, uh, etc. But then the, the, the next stage of a metrosnography is to, to read what you've found. Now as in uh, 
in the same way that if you're doing uh, primary uh, qualitative research, you might start off just by listening to your interview um, recordings or maybe reading the transcripts, just making some odd notes, not being kind of serious or systematic about it. About it. So it's just trying to get an initial flavour of what you're doing. And similarly, Noblet and Hare um, say that that's what you should do uh, here. However, since this has been kind of taken on under the rubric of health technology assessment and um, effectiveness uh, in, in healthcare, these aspects have become a little more um, systematized. So the, the critical appraisal skills uh, program um, criteria for assessing and qualitative research are widely used. There are other tools that you can use as well, and for those of you who are interested, there's a methodological debate about which tool you should use. There have been researchers who've compared one tool against another, but I think it's it's fair to say that the CASP tool is probably the most widely used one. Um, I want to give you, uh, as well as the overview, I want you to point you to some of the nuts and bolts that are involved in this. And in order to do this, I'm going to draw on some work uh, in progress, which is a synthesis that I've been involved in, which is about um, qualitative studies in patient safety um, in primary care. And I suppose the main reason uh, for undertaking this work was more of a personal one. So I've just started working in patient safety. It's not really a field. Uh, well, I'm okay with the literature, so this was as much about me surveying the literature, getting some handle on, on what the issues are in, in um, patient safety in uh, primary care. But on the other hand, we also wanted to develop an explicit theoretical framework that we're going to use in an ongoing uh, primary uh, qualitative study that we're doing about uh, patient safety in primary care. So in the um, metasynthesis that I've been working on which is about patient safety in primary care, here's an example of one of the papers uh, that was found. This is um, a qualitative study which is having a look at the cause, the causes of prescribing errors in English general practice. Now Again, once you've got your articles, it's there are many, many different ways that you can extract the findings. Um, the kind of technology available these days, I haven't used it yet, but the easiest way would probably be to import your PDFs so straight into Envivo or something, and then you could tag everything in Envivo. Some are qualitative researchers still prefer to work with paper and pencil, you can use Excel, you can use Microsoft Word. I don't think there's any particular right or wrong way of doing it, you just have to be clear about um, what you've done. So as I, uh, as I showed you earlier, when we come to reading the report of a qualitative study, we'll generally get kind of quotations from interviews interspersed with, with text. Now, in a metroethnography, we're interested, we aren't interested in the data, so we're not interested in the specific uh, quotations. We're interested in the, the findings. Um, so that's just an important um, distinction I want you to draw. So, so the findings are kind of the interpretations that the original researchers came to themselves having undertaken all these interviews and read them. They then came to some conclusions which should be evident um, as you read through the, re normally the results and the discussion um, section of the manuscript. So what I've done here, I've highlighted in yellow the bits that I would extract from this if I was extracting things onto a data extraction form. So the first thing, I wouldn't extract that because it's, um, it's a quotation. I mean, there, are, there, there is one school of thought which said that these uh, quotations are supposed to be good examples, but I know from being um, having worked in a primary or qualitative research myself that often quotes are selected because there's something unusual about them, so I'm actually a bit wary about using quotations and that is represented. But what we're interested in is the findings. So this is a, clearly a finding here. Perceptions of risk appear to be influenced by whether the GP was aware of having made an error in the past. So I would take that out, I'd put a quotation mark around it, and I'd attach a page number to it, B716, B so if I ever wanted to go back and find that again in which the context 
it is our producer. The next thing I would take out is the severity potential of growth for drug effects, and then this issue about uh, tiredness and anxiety, which might have um, affected the ability of GPs uh, to concentrate. So there are, there are various things that I would take out here. Now, there's a bit here where they say, um, under the team, it says, poor communication in nurses are a quasi-autonomous role. I'd take those out. Now, down here, you'll see it says, although it has become custom in general practice, GPs to sign prescriptions generated by nurses, one GP question is safety of this process, and then we've got a quote. Now, I haven't chosen to extract anything from that. Firstly, because there doesn't seem to be a finding there. It's just a description of something. And secondly, that the case that they're presenting here is just something about what one GP has, has, has said, and I'm more interested in the overall findings rather than, than the particularities of what one um, person um, has said. So after you've extracted the information, and again, you'll find in the methodological reports that I've alluded to that there are various ways of doing that. But what Noble at hand hair say that you should then do is create a list of the key metaphors, phrases, ideas, and concepts, and how they appear to be um, related um, to each other, and then uh, juxtapose them in various ways. It, counts, it sounds fairly simple, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, the way I do this in uh, practice is to put my findings into uh, tables, and I'll show you an example of that later. But we find that you have to constantly rejig the tables until they seem to capture the data in a meaningful way. So if you've got a table where half of the cells are empty and all of your findings are concentrated in, in two or three areas of the table, I'd probably say that that isn't capturing the data um, in a good way. And as I said, all along, be aware of the distinction between first order findings, i.e. Like what the patient says, then you get the constructs or themes that the researchers have applied to the data themselves. And then the third order interpretations are any interpretations that you manage to derive yourself from these attempts to fit all of the information together in a little uh, after the next couple of slides, I'll show you an example of a table where I've tried to fit some of the, uh, the findings. So when Noblet and Hare in their text, they talk about translating the findings of one study into another. So you normally, I would normally arrange them in uh, chronological order, the assumption being that if something's been published, they should generally cite what's gone before, although in a qualitative research that can often not be the case. People seem to like to reinvent the wheel, um, which is a bit unfortunate. But this, um, so you normally start with the first paper and then you get the second paper and see if that fits the first one. So are the findings the same? Are they neatly uh, translatable um, across the two? And this is a bit like the constant comparative method that's employed by a primary uh, qualitative researchers and is the hallmark of grounded theory. Unfortunately, this method at Manchester session is not about grounded theory, so uh, that will have to wait for another day. Also, you're not translating, it's a bit at the start when I was saying that there's a difference between what people are actually talking about, but what the, the analytical categories are, if you have a look at things on a conceptual level. So rather than focusing on the particularities or the substance of what's being said, you're more interested in sometimes it might be not what's, it, it, it might be things that aren't said um, that appear more important. But this, here we get into to the realms of why higher analytical work is so difficult and why it, it tends to be subjective. Uh, from person to person, but Noblet and Hare talk about translation being idiomatic rather than liberal, um, literal, and what you want to do is try to preserve the structure of the relationships between the concepts that appeared in the first place. So I've got an example here that draws partly on the, um, so the paper I showed you which was about patient safety and prescribing English general practice was this citation number 59 here. Part of the synthesis is all part of the synthesis process is always about data reduction. So as you go along, you find your quotes will get shorter and shorter until you get to some kind of essence of what they were about. So 
Various attempts were made to fit all these quotes into a table where things in the same cell were all about the same things. So these, this um, particular subset of papers here were all about medication safety and their primary care. And when I had a look at the findings, they mainly seemed to break down into social issues, into technical ones, so either relationships between people or issues around systems or machines. So some of the, the things I extracted earlier went in this um, cell here, which was all about the kind of social characteristics of patients, that patients are difficult and demanding, they might have poor levels of, uh, of comprehension, they don't remember things, they present with things that the GPs only consider to be routine issues on the one hand. But these are all about the, the characteristics of patients which are seen as uh, problematic in patient safety terms. So once you've gone through some kind of process of trying to, um, to reduce the, the, the findings, make, make sense of them in a kind of aggregative way, the next step is then to try to make a conceptual um, leap, which is about um, synthesizing um, the translations. As I've said uh, right from the start and stressed throughout, this is probably the biggest challenge of the work, which might explain why in France's systematic review of the 32 recently published metro ethnographies, they found only one paper had unambiguously described how they synthesized the translations. And this was the Franzel paper um, I pointed you to earlier, the one about um, complementary medicines. Um, so here they talk about the clusters were compared to each other and classified resulting in our new third or the concepts with dimensions and sub-themes. This process was quite similar to standard primary qualitative research in terms of subjectivity of interpretation and can be compared to a grounded uh, theory approach. Kind of making the same point uh, that I've made independently myself. So where the, the larger table that I showed you earlier, which more, was more of an aggregation here, I've tried, attempted some conceptual development. So the, the aspects of the cell I, I showed you, which was about the social characteristics, essentially it seemed to boil down into two issues, which were all about something about the patient which they turned up, which I had to problematic uh, presentation. The patients were seen as uh, problematic in some way. So there probably is a bit of um, conceptual development there, whereas in this cognitive and educational de deficiencies on the face of it, that appears more aggregative uh, rather than um, conceptual. So in the medication safety synthesis, because we had such a large number of papers, we broke them down into subgroups which appeared to be about the same things. One was about the views of patients, one was about the views of staff, one was about um, systems issues, and one was about uh, prescribing. So this was the part of the table here which was about uh, prescribing, and then when we'd been through that whole uh, translation process, the next stage was to try to bring them, to, to synthesize the translations in more of a conceptual way. And just to point you again back to Francis' um, systematic review, uh, in over a third of papers, it was unclear from the information given if the reviewers had actually achieved a new interpretation because the analysis process was not comprehensively described and or it was unclear whether they had simply aggregated the author's concepts from the primary studies. Uh, as I've, I've tried to be completely blunt and open with you that I find analytical work personally uh, challenging. Uh, and I think it's just a question of being honest about what you think you've achieved. If you think you, you haven't achieved any a analytical development, then just say that. I mean, it's probably more helpful if you do that rather than waiting for the referees to tell you um, and using it as an excuse to reject your manuscript. But I suppose generally, and if you have a look at the key references, especially by Pandora Pound and by Alice Malpass, I don't expect you to be able to read the text on there. I'm going to explode a part of this diagram in a moment. But in general terms, when people talk about uh, presenting things uh, conceptually, it can often uh, work by constructing <coughs> diagrams. So here we've got different kind of groups. And then there are arrows showing how there might be a relationship either one way or unidirectionally between those things. 
um, to kind of highlight the issues and factors that are important in patient safety. So just to kind of go on further from where I started with the, the patient characteristics. So after we synthesized all of the, uh, the translations in the different groups, these were basically the issues around patients that would seem to threaten patient safety in, in, in uh, primary care. And then there's a kind of an interaction between the issues in the health and system which create various problems, a mismatch between patient behaviors and system requirements. And then we've got issues of communication between the patients and staff, <coughs> arrogant behavior which might lead to mistrust, uh, unsuccessful uh, insufficient communication and jumping to conclusions. Um, I suppose there's basically two ways you can be conceptual. I tend to be conceptual in a narrative sense, so it's more about writing and drawing in theory. Other people use diagrams. I think probably some some combination of the two is best because different readers assimilate information in different ways. Now, as I've said, conceptual development is a highly desired. Uh, and it's meant to be the whole point of doing a meta-ethnography in the first place. But as I've said in my personal experience, you don't always achieve um, conceptual development. So this is kind of pulling out some of the key issues that were raised in the, the France Systematic Review, the Campbell Report, and from my own personal experience as well. So you're less likely to get a conceptual development if you only find a small number of original um, research reports to work with. If you've only got three or four, um, they could all be talking about the same thing. They could all be talking about different things. On the other hand, if you've got a highly saturated research field, so when I was doing the, the meta-synthesis of patient experiences of rheumatoid arthritis, I think I ended up working with 50, 60 articles, but a lot of them were basically saying the same thing over and over again. Um, some uh, qualitative research these days, especially if it's applied, tends to be very descriptive in nature. Sometimes you might not actually get any conceptual development from the author of the research in the, in the first place. You might just get a list of description and themes, and again, that's quite challenging the way you kind of take that if you just end up with a list of things. The other thing I found, you know, um, Traditionally, uh, qualitative research is supposed to be a subjective, interpretive, iterative enterprise, but sometimes it can feel that the mechanistic approach applied to something like searching or data extraction might actually stifle the kind of uh, creative process that you might apply in primary qualitative research. So I know primary qualitative researchers would still like to work with post-it notes and stuff all over pieces of paper rather than using in vivo. One issue that uh, crops up is can you do a meta-ethnography alone? I think the short answer to that is yes, but it's likely to be better uh, quality if there are more people involved. Anyone who's worked as part of a research team, you know, some of these articles you see can have five, six, ten authors on the paper. Uh, any of us who've worked with researchers will know that there's generally only one person who's doing the main bulk of work. But it can help to have some input, especially when you, you come to the conceptual stage from people from different allied academic disciplines. So if I was doing something about patient experiences, it might be good to have a clinician on the team, a sociologist, a psychologist, someone who's worked in that field. Essentially, the more learning someone's had, the more theories they've been exposed to, the more likely they are to be able to impose um, some kind of analytical approach. So in conclusion, metroethnography is one way of synthesizing the findings of published reports of qualitative studies. It's iterative, it's interpretive. It relies on the translation of the findings from each study into all of the others. Um, results can normally be expressed in one of three ways, either in a reciprocal way, when all the studies seem to be saying the same thing, in a refutational way, if different groups of findings seem to kind of contradict or argue with each other, 
Or alternatively, different groups of studies might be speaking to different parts of the jigsaw, which I suppose was more what the patient safety, how the patient safety synthesis came out, and we ended up with more of a line of argument. So although metroethnography is still evolving, it's been well de developed and is now well established in health services research, most of the, 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 the good journals will accept metroethnographies in their scene uh, as a reasonable way of synthesizing literature, but I've also uh, tried to stress that this kind of work is best undertaken by a team that includes both experienced qualitative researchers and people with advanced analytical skills. Um, so Emma France and others with the systematic review of reviews um, that I showed you about earlier, that was a kind of prelim to some work that they're going to do. They're going to be developing specific reporting guidelines for metroethnography, so they would supersede the NTREC ones I pointed you to earlier. So